Whether it's OpenRC, Run It, System D, Init, or if you're over on macOS, you'll have Launch D. Every single Unix and Unix-like system is going to have something known as an init program. This is that program you see that always runs as PID1. Now, all of these have their own different implementations with their own different goals and their own different feature sets. But today I want to answer a couple of very simple questions, or at least seemingly simple questions. And that is, what is the point of a NIT system and what do they actually do? Now, I'm going to be talking in a very general sense today. I'm not going to go into specific implementation details about System D or OpenRC. If you're interested in that, I would recommend checking out their relevant documentation, or better yet, just examining the source code. That's not what I want to talk about today. I want to try to answer this as generally as possible, and you might not expect this, but that kind of makes the question way, way harder to answer, and you'll see why in just a bit. Let's start with the easy question. Why PID1? So to understand this, we first have to understand how a Unix-like system actually starts up. So the first thing that's going to happen once you power it on is the BIOS or UEFI on your motherboard is going to go and look for something known as a bootloader. This is the program that's going to go and start up your kernel. So this could be something like Grub or anything else like that. I'm just going to go with Grub for this example here. So Grub is going to go and find the Linux kernel and once that's started up, the Linux kernel by itself, while it has a lot of functionality, it can't really be interacted with just with the kernel by itself. To make sure that something can actually happen on this system, the kernel is going to go and launch up one process. This process is the only process that's going to be launched up directly by the kernel, and this process is going to be your init. And PIDs are assigned sequentially, therefore PID1. Now, you might be wondering why no PID 0? A lot of things in computing are started from 0 rather than starting from 1. Well, in the case of PID 0, that's never actually assigned. But because of this, you might hear the kernel referred to as PID 0 through informal means. Technically, it's not completely correct, but for the sake of demonstration, it does make sense. Now, what would happen if the kernel just couldn't find an init system or the init simply didn't exist? Well, basically, the kernel is going to kernel panic. Effectively, this is a crash. And we can go and demonstrate this inside of a VM. So if we go and run this now, what's going to happen if we give it a moment? As we can see, it is kernel panicked. And basically, there's not really much we can do from here. One very important thing about your init is it must continue to run until the system shuts down. As we saw, if the init system isn't there, the kernel is going to panic. And because every process is forked from another process, if the init crashes, every single process that has been forked from that process is going to crash as well. In most cases, this is going to lead to a kernel panic, but depending on the kernel version, sometimes it may continue to run and give you some way to actually recover from this state. There's not much of a way to recover though, so it's best to not have your init crash altogether. Now, regardless of which init you're going to be using, your init path is going to be hard-coded, so it's going to be located at slash bin slash init. I'm not sure if it's the same under macOS, but I presume it is going to be as well. The reason why it's like this is regardless of which init system you're using, whether it's OpenRC or System DNIT or anything else, the kernel always knows where the init is going to be located. Now, as for the other question, what does an init do? This is a much, much harder question to answer. So, what an init system has to do and what they do in practice can be very, very different. So, as I said, every process has to be forked from another process. So you're going to need some process to be the parent to all of the orphan processes and the ancestor to everything as well. And many units do this in process one, but many others don't and have a dedicated service manager. This service manager is gonna go and start up all the low level processes, things like journaling, timers, networking, all of that stuff that you expect to be there with a working system. These processes are gonna go and start up other processes and more processes and more processes until you get to the point where your system is running everything that it should be running. Both Runit and S6 
do separate out this service manager. One benefit in doing so is if the service manager crashes, it won't bring the entire system down. It'll just bring most of the system down. You won't get a kernel panic though. Your init can then just go and restart the service manager and hopefully recover the entire system. While all this stuff is incredibly important if you want a system that is actually usable, you don't need to be doing any of this to make it so the kernel won't kernel panic. So clearly, it's not the minimal subset of what an init must do. So we have to go a little bit lower then. So there's some stuff that has to be handled at this incredibly low level. Things like handling the signals that go between applications and the kernel. Things like sig int, sig power, sig wind basically allowing applications to be able to use these signals and have them mean what the program thinks they actually mean. Or things like mounting the API file systems and flushing the file system cache. But even so, this doesn't actually answer the question because really, you don't need to be doing this either. The kernel still won't kernel panic if you just don't do this. And here's the kicker. Any program can be your init. Surely, Brody, you can't mean that literally anything can be your init. There has to be, like, some limitations, right? No. No. I, I, there doesn't need to be any limitations. So let's go and do something dumb. Let's set our init to be slash user slash bin slash, I don't know, let's go with uh, the ranger file manager, for example. So let's go and start that and give it a second. And as we're going to see, it's going to launch perfectly fine. And we have a file manager. Now, here's the problem. What would happen if we go and say quit out of this file manager? Because our file manager right now is acting as our init. The same thing is going to happen anytime any other init dies. The kernel is going to panic. So clearly there's no functional reason to use any program not designed to be an init, right? Well, no, not exactly. There is one very good reason. So let's go and set our init to be something different. This time, let's go and set it to be slash bin slash bash. And if we go and start this now, what you're going to see, give it one second, it drops us straight into a root shell. It didn't prompt us for a password or anything like that. It just dropped us straight into the shell. So you might be thinking, okay, is this like maybe a limited version of Bash that maybe doesn't have access to all your data because that would be a massive security vulnerability. Well, let's go and do an ls, ls our home directory. That is my home folder right there. If we go and do a NeoFetch, as we'll see, it runs NeoFetch perfectly fine. So what this is, is just running nothing else on my system except for bash. And yes, this is a security vulnerability. If you want to stop this from happening, you have to go and password lock your BIOS or UEFI and password lock Grub, but it is just as much of a security vulnerability as not having your drive encrypted. This is here on purpose. The reason why it's like this is if you go and say mess up your system configs, you can still go and recover everything without having all of this other stuff launch up. So let's say, for example, you forget your root password. This just drops you straight into the shell and allows you to change it. And for home Linux users, that's perfectly fine. But if you're running, say, a server farm, you probably should go and password lock those things to make it so if someone does get physical access to the hardware, they can't just go and do whatever they want. Amusingly enough, your init doesn't even have to be a binary. If you want to, you should go and make it a shell script, and the shell script is going to go and launch up the shell that it needs to make sure it can actually run. So ultimately, the kernel has no way of knowing what the init program actually is. All it's going to do is try and launch it. And once it's launched, it doesn't really care from there. I know someone is going to say, but Brody, you didn't really answer the question. And this is the problem. There isn't really an answer to this question. Some people are going to try to answer it, but ultimately... All the init program actually is, is the first program the kernel launches. This can be a full init system that will get you a functional system, even to the point of a graphical environment, or it could just be bash that gives you a root shell that allows you to go and modify some files. The kernel does not care. 
if you take nothing else away from this video, at least take away the fact that if you ever forget your password, you could always go and tell Grub or whatever your bootloader is to just go and use Fish or Bash or whatever shell you want to use and always recover it. Unless you're on macOS, in which case I cannot help you. So if you like this video and you want to support the channel, become one of these amazing people over here, please go check out my Patreon, subscribe, star, leave a pay, all linked in the description down below. I've got a podcast called Tech Over Tea, where I don't really talk about tech, but there is some tea. Available basically anywhere. I've got a gaming channel called Brody Robertson Plays, where I live stream twice a week and upload about five or so YouTube shorts. And this channel is also available over on Odyssey. That's going to be it for me, and I'm out.